Recently, a person contacted a local animal welfare group in Jakjakarta asking for help. Her cat had been bitten by a snake and she couldn't get any of the help that she needed. What was the problem? Her cat was bitten by a green-bodied snake with a red tail. And in Jakjakarta, that can only mean one thing. This video is going to be in three parts. The first is what happens if you're bitten by a snake. The second is what happens if your pet is bitten by a snake. And the third is going to be the story of the specific species that bit this cat in particular. And to help me throughout this video, I've enlisted my friend and herpetologist, Dunan Satria, and we will be intercutting with an interview that I conducted with him also recently. So, if you're bitten by a snake, you would want it to be in three ways. The first is you would want to be bitten in a part that is easy to manage. This means that you would prefer to be bitten on your arm versus your leg, and Donan actually explained this very well. Okay, uh, it depends on the body part get bitten. If it's bitten by, uh, on your legs, it's difficult. You, you still have to, to ask people to, to, carry, to, to you. carry you there. But if, if it, if it gets bitten uh, in your hands or your upper limb, you can immobilize like this and then you still can walk. So the fact is probably you would prefer to be bitten on the arm if you're hiking somewhere because then at least you could hold your arm as you're trying to get to help as opposed to walking on your foot that's been bitten. And that makes a lot of sense. The second is that if you're bitten by a venomous snake, you would really prefer that it's a dry bite. And what is a dry bite? Well, it's simply when the snake does not inject any venom. And there's a good reason for why it would not do this. Snakes actually take a lot of energy to produce their venom. And if they don't have to, they would prefer not to actually use it. So if a snake does actually release the venom from its fangs, it's with purpose and it's for a reason. And you would prefer you and your potential death to not be the reason and so you would simply prefer for it to be a dry bite and finally you would want there to be anti-venom for the specific species that bit you this might sound quite simple but in reality it's not really in Indonesia there is actually only anti-venom for three species and again Donan will help explain this part but only one uh, antivenom, which is polyvalent antivenom, and it, uh, it can be used to cure for three species, three different species, the uh, Calocelasma rhodostoma, the terrestrial vipers, the crate, and also uh, for spitting cobra. If, you're, if you are bitten by a crate mm -hmm. and you go to the clinic, uh, there's a good chance you can Yes, I think yeah. I I think when I get bitten by a crate and then go to the clinic or hospital, I think I, I have a bigger chance to get this antivenom. But if you're bitten by green tree viper, if I get bitten by this uh, viper, we don't have any antivenom in Indonesia. It's not available. So you in have Indonesia. to immobilize. Yes, I have to do uh, immobilization. So just to recap. If you're bitten by a venomous snake, you would want it to be in a part of your body that is easy to manage. You would want it to be a dry bite so that you're not getting any venom or, or maybe a little amount of venom. And you would want it to be by a species that at least we have the anti-venom for. And in the case of Indonesia, it's only three species. And so you'll only be able to get your anti-venom if it's the ground viper, if it's a spitting cobra, or if it's the banded crate. And otherwise, if we do not have the antivenom for it, then we have to use other methods of actually treating the snake bite, which was actually the experience of Donan himself. And you were actually bitten by a snake before. Yes. I... Well, multiple times, but the one specific time you were bitten also by 
Pay Trimary series. Yeah, pay trimary series. And since uh, I don't, we don't have any antivenom, I have to do uh, immobilization. I have to immobilize my hands, my limbs, and then uh, I have to rest for one week, and then I have to, to consume uh, nutritious food in order to get my, uh, my immune system be able to stand against this antivenom. Now let's look at what happens if your pet is bitten by a venomous snake. And unfortunately, we don't really have a lot of information in this aspect because many times if someone's pet is bitten by a snake, and this is usually going to be a cat or a dog, uh, we actually don't have information on it because usually the animal will die before we do get that information, before we receive a report of the fact that your pet or someone's pet has been bitten by a venomous snake. So the simple fact is that we don't really know what to do because we don't have a lot of information on it. In this specific story, we are actually lucky because the person saw the snake that did bite them, which is one actual important aspect of it, which is you do want to see the snake that bites you or bites your pet and then at least be able to report to the kind of snake that did it. And Donan also noted this fact. It's important for us, the victim, to identify the snakes because it will help the doctor to, to choose the proper or the correct uh, antivenom. So it matters that, that the woman, like she at least said, aha, it's a green snake that, mm. that bit them. If, uh, how difficult is it if I don't know what snake bit me? Oh. That's quite difficult because, uh, especially for green snakes, green tree snake, we have at least three species of green tree. Uh, what what about between the ones we do have the antivenom for? So let's say I'm bitten by snake, and it might be cobra, it might be crate, might be viper, but I don't know. Is there a procedure for the doctor? Yes, there is a procedure for the doctor. Uh, it's wait and see, or not wait and see, it, to observe their, uh, their symptoms. Mm -hmm whether the symptoms is closely or more likely uh, symptom of hemotoxin or neurotoxin, and then he can continue to other procedures, mm -hmm. meaning, okay, for if, it, if it's uh, a neurotoxin symptom, you have uh, the probably crate or cobra. When it's a hemotoxin, it's probably the calocelasma or the Yeah, so, but that means you cannot act immediately. No. Yes, yes, you have yeah, to wait, wait to and wait. see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's important to, if you're the victim, to at least try to, mm -hmm. to see the snake. Yes. Truthfully, some people might have experience, yeah. but it's just not a wide scale knowledge. And Donan himself had never heard of uh, such a report of a cat being bitten by a venomous snake. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. I, because I never, yeah, I, I never saw any any, uh, any cat victims get bitten by by venomous snakes. And now let's look at the story of the specific species that bit this cat. So how do we know that it is the species that we think it to be? And in this case, the owner of the cat said that it's a green-bodied snake with a red tail. And in Jakarta, we know it to be one specific species. And that is, in fact, Trimeserus albolabris. And we know it to be this specific snake because it is a green tree viper. And in the entirety of Java, there are, in fact, only two green tree vipers. One of them is Albularis, the other one is in the same genus, and it's Insularis. And in the case of Jakarta, we know it's going to be this specific one because this specific species only inhabits this range. In fact, Insularis only inhabits the eastern part of Java. And as Dona notes, if you're bitten by a green tree viper in eastern Java, it's more likely to actually be insularis, not actually albolabris. So if we are in Jagja, mm -hmm. the answer is pretty easy. We know that it is going to be albolabris because we don't find insularis in central Java. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, if we are in East Java, now it's more difficult. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. So yeah, but mostly in East Java is for Insularis one, mostly. Uh, but in Central Java and West Java and Yogyakarta mostly, or naturally, we found only uh, Alpulabris. What makes this an interesting story, and it's the fact that if we look at the ranges of these two snakes, we can ask several questions. And the first question is really, why is it that Insularis is found in Java, but not in the western parts of Java or the central parts of Java? And then at the same time, why is Albularis not really found east of Java? Because, well, these are similar snakes. They're in the same genus. They pretty much look the same. And Dona notes that really these snakes are very similar. And they have one interesting aspect that does actually separate them, which is the fact that they have different eye colors. Let's look at that a little bit more. What's the main differentiator between these two snakes? For quick uh, determination, we can use the, the eye colors or the, or the pupil. When, when the eye color is uh, yellow, most probably albulabris. When uh, their eyes is red, most probably it's insularis. Mm -hmm. And so that's a quick indicator that would tell us. Yes. Mm -hmm. But not a conclusive indicator. Yes, uh, it's a quick indicator, but it's not uh, scientific identification. To recognize uh, the species, you have to uh, see the scales uh, around the head. You have to count the scales around the head and around the body, I think. So, Abulabris means literally white lips. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the name is very specific, white lips. White lips. Mm -hmm. But sometimes in Solaris it's also called a white lipped, white lipped viper. Yes, because, uh, well, you, uh, I think both are white lipped vipers, but since uh, in Solaris only in small islands, that way they have their own different uh, specific name, the insularis, meaning in, in, insular meaning uh, islands, so they are coming from the islands. Both are actually white lip, mm -hmm. because both have a similar morphological uh, sign, the uh, li uh, white lip on their, on their head. So it still can be called that, but that's not really the proper common name. Yes. Mm -hmm. It should be Lesser Sunda Island. Uh, maybe, this is my, my, my hypothesis, why they 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 uh, they name it white lip because uh, I think they are already stored in the preserved liquid and then their color is bleached so it's become mm. whiter on, okay. on, on that yeah. on the uh, on the mouth on the mouth more whiter compared to the head I mean mm. yeah this light green become whitish because yeah. of the bleaching process and then the scientists saw it as a white and then they name it white lip that's my hypothesis and that's you what usually happen to other species yeah now we're going on a different tangent <laughs> yes. because this is basically so the the implication is that many species are actually incorrectly named because the sample is not a living sample yes. that they were looking mm -hmm. at yeah that's now that's a different question <laughs> yeah it's an interesting differentiator between Albulabris and Insularis that one of them has a yellow eye and the other one has a red one. But in reality, of course, this is not really enough to differentiate them. There are other ways that we would have to employ. And as Onan said to me, you know, molecular analysis would be the, the correct path to do that using modern technology. But in terms of their ranges, again, why is it that one of them does not go west and the other one does not go east? And we do get into an interesting aspect of biogeography here where we can consider the Wallace line. Realistically, we have to ask the simple question of the fact that if we go from Java to Bali and then to Nusantagara and to the rest of the Lesser Sunda Islands, they have to hop from island to island to island. These snakes cannot swim. So the way that they are moving across this chain is the simple fact that they are hitchhiking on something. 
if we look at the past where the sea levels were lower, we might get one answer there, which is the fact that they would simply be able to cross on land. And when sea levels were lower in the most recent ice age, it was, ooh, it was actually true that species would be able to migrate across the Indonesian archipelago, at least parts of it, some parts they would not be able to cross, but we would have the Sunda shelf and they would be able to move along the Sunda shelf. But as sea levels go up again and these snakes cannot swim, we do have to ask the question of why can they move across these islands? And the simple answer again is that they are hitchhiking. Whether it be through some sort of vegetation that maybe is washed ashore from a storm, or more likely that they are carried by humans, of course unintentionally, they will be arriving in these different parts. And so we do then get to the question of, was Insularis in Java from the beginning, or was it in Bali and then came to Java, meaning that it already differentiated from Abulabris a long time ago, or did they differentiate more recently? We still don't know the, the reason that Insularis is found in East Java, whether it is purely transported by people, because you mentioned that uh, people have said that it's been mm. there for a long time already. Yes, so far I didn't found any scientific uh, explanation on this, but uh, based on, on, on local people, that uh, they said that it's already there for many years ago. Yeah, maybe we can assume that they were already there. But we don't know if they were introduced yes. a long time, long ago. time ago. Hello from the editing desk. I think it's just worth adding here that there is one study that did actually suggest that Insularis could in fact have gone from the Lesser Sunda Islands to East Java. So instead of going from west to east, going from east to west. And this is directly related to the fact that the Indonesian through flow does go from north to south. So the basis for it is really the direction of the ocean's currents. And meanwhile, Heinzone did also find that only a few Australasian species have been successfully translocated by humans across the Wallace Line. That's why I asked if you know when they became different species, because uh, if they became different species in Java, then it's okay that you find insularis there. Mm -hmm. But but if they became different species after, like you know, after the ice age and mm -hmm. the Sunda shelf is underwater, once I assume these snakes cannot swim. Yes, they cannot swim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the sea level is too high between mm -hmm. Bali and Java, mm -hmm. there's no way for them to naturally disperse. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. So only. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I mean, it's yeah, it's impossible for them to to cross this uh, geographical barrier, especially when the uh, the sea level is rising up because they are uh, they're not water snake and they are living on trees, so it's impossible for them to to swim across this this barrier. Yeah, so it has to be taken by human or maybe just yes, chance. Yeah, yeah accidentally. And so again, we go back to the question of how do we find one in one area and the other not in the other? And uh, one could be competition, but again, we go back to the question of when did they differentiate? Because these snakes inhabit the same habitat, they have the same prey. Really, they should be overlapping in some way, but as we go to the east, as we go to eastern Java, we find that Insularis begins to replace Albalabris, or there is some specific border where it then does replace Albalabris. And even though we might find a few individuals of Albalabris in Bali, this is really more accidental or incidental than them actually having an established population there. And uh, Albalabris should not be found east of Java, only as far as east of Java. Mm -hmm. But it's still some are found in Bali. Yes, I think uh, in some or uh, in previous research, Albolabris can also reach Bali, and it's possible to to have uh, Albolabris in East Java. But I think uh, when you go farther eastern, it's it's impossible to find it. Do you still find Insularis here? 
some record yes we do find several insularis not several only one or two insularis in the wild but i'm not sure that it was naturally or it was uh, introduced yeah introduced mm -hmm. One important thing is the Wallace line, and there is actually a really good video on this by PBS Eons, and really I, I recommend you watch that instead of me having to explain it. But the Wallace line is a very important line because it helps us to differentiate between Asiatic species or Asian species and Australasian species, because as we go from the mainland of Asia down through Sumatra, Java, Bali, and then we go from west to east and Usan Tangara, we find that species change and certain species die out and are replaced by other kinds of species. And as we go from east to west, this changes. And then we see that species that are found on the western part of the Wallace line are not found on the eastern part. And similarly, species that we find on the eastern part, we don't actually find on the western part. The Wallace line actually separates species, and there are many reasons for this. In the case of crossing from Bali to Lombok, there is one actually simple answer, but part of other groups of answers, and it's that these are very difficult waters to cross. And so if species have to cross these waters, they're going to have a very difficult time doing it. This creates a very specific line where simply species that are found in Bali are not going to be found in Lombok and, and vice versa. Donan did say that this is actually the truth for Abulabris, where we might find a few individuals of Abulabris in Bali, but for a fact, we are not going to find Lombok with Abulabris. We're not going to find Abulabris in Lombok or really going anywhere east. So there is a very specific hard border for Albalabris, which is Bali, which means that the Wallace line is a hard border for it. But in the case of Insularis, this is not the fact. Because Insularis, and it's known sometimes as the Lesser Sunda Islands viper, it's found all the way across the Lesser Sunda Islands, and then even able to cross from Bali into Java. Going back to our original question of, was it always in Java, or did it cross back and forth in some way, which of course species can do. Dispersal is not a one-way thing, it can go back and forth. And so is Insularis going back and forth? These are very interesting questions and maybe in the case of the cat that was bitten, not very important ones because, I mean, I do have to note that functionally, whether you are bitten by Insularis or Albolabris, in Indonesia, we do not have the anti-venom for these snakes. And so you're just going to have to treat them in the same way. There is no functional difference between these species. Ultimately, despite the tragedy of this person's cat being bitten by Albolabris, there are still some things that we can learn from tragedy. We can learn more about the distribution and ranges of species and potentially why they do not cross certain barriers. I do think there are still some more interesting questions to ask. For example, was the true difference between Albolabris and Insularis? As I did as Donan, is it taxonomic nonsense? It's not, but sometimes there is taxonomic nonsense. And in the case of this cat, I don't know if it survived, but I don't expect that it did by, by the simple fact that there is no antivenom for Abalabris and it is still a viper biting a cat. The measures that we would have to employ are, would be very difficult for a cat, such as immobilization. And so I hope that he or she survived, but uh, I don't have a lot of hope personally. But again, there's still some things that we can learn from tragedy and these are the things that we can learn. 
especially about snakes, which tend to be vilified and underappreciated, saying as someone who has a phobia of snakes, underappreciated. Well, thank you for watching, and I do recommend that you watch the full interview with Donan, and I'll see you next time. To be bitten in an advantageous position. Yeah, position. You would be bitten in a position. Oh, why do I keep saying position? And one simple way is. No, I already went into the thing, right? Ba -ba 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 -ba. You can see me. Is it annoying? Maybe it is. In this video, we're going to look at. This video will be in three. Hmm. I think it's too sunny here. Hmm. I'm actually too short. So. Contacted a local welfare group in Jagjikarta. Hmm. Recently, a person contacted a local wealth. Recently, a person con... We get into an interesting... Oh, it's some kind of hopping creature. <laughs> it's not a squirrel. It's if it's a mouse, it was hopping. So, <laughs> well, I'm in nature, and at least it's not a snake, right? So, and the third is something about this. Yeah. The first is that you're bitten in a body part that is easy to treat. I have not even gotten to Donan yet. And we will be in... This video, this video is going to be in a closely related one that also is nearby. Why don't I just say relative? Hopefully the sound is good. I don't know. All or any venom. No, it's, it's, it's none of the venom. Uh, and so, what if you are bitten by a So if, if species, I, I need to drink. I'm getting a bit dark in it. Getting a bit dark in it. And now let's look at the example. No. Dogs are barking. It's getting too dark, I think. Mm -hmm. That is out competing in Solaris. But then, no, I don't think that's accurate to say. Yeah, we're running out of light. <laughs>